Let's see, I met Brad, I don't know, about six years ago. Yeah. We didn't really talk much. And he's just some stupid sound guy at a Gospel White Baptist Church in Malvern, Arkansas. Uh, Brother Brad is from Brother John Horton's church. And uh, as I said this morning, last year, uh, Brother John let me know that Brad w- had taken Landmark Baptist down south, and we got together when John was here last, and um, just fellowship with him a little bit. And, and uh, Brad and I just, you know, we hung out quite a, quite a bit. And uh, he's been a help to me. Um, I wouldn't have known about our slide system and, and all that stuff if not for him. He's a huge help there. You guys have no idea the amount of work that alleviated and how grateful I am. Um, we've had many deep theological discussions. We've encouraged one another, and uh, he is a friend, and I thank God for him, and I'm glad that he can come and uh, be with us tonight. Y'all pray for uh, him and uh, his family, because it, it's, it's kind of a church plant almost, and uh, uh, they're starting from a, a, a small group, and, and I know God's been blessing. I'm even a little jealous of some of the stuff I, God's doing down there, so you can share whatever you want, but come get some messages, I guess. So, uh, my wife's over there complaining it's cold. Does anybody else feel that way on a regular basis around here? Ah, I see. You have to choose your seat wisely, I'm sure. And uh, learning a little bit about your pastor, uh, I know he doesn't get cold very easy at all. And so, uh, and the platform is often the warmest place, so got to keep it cold. Uh, that's I I uh, I uh, I like it cooler than warmer and we we have um, small disputes about that in our home so I understand it but uh, I uh, grew up in Georgia, um, so I was a southern, southern-born boy, and uh, when I was nine years old, my dad took an assistant pastor in Trafalgar, Indiana, and so for three years, we lived up here, and we lived in Franklin, and so I got to know Greenwood, I got to know a little bit of Indianapolis, and it was exciting and fun, and then we moved back to Georgia. God called me to preach, and I went to Bible college. And then there I met my better half, my beautiful wife, and uh, we got married, and we moved to Arkansas. And for six years, we were in Arkansas with Pastor Horton, and then knew God was calling me to be a pastor, came across Landmark Baptist Church. We are um, close to the University of Indianapolis, and uh, we are there now. We've been there almost a, a full year. Next Sunday will be one year for us, and it's been an adventure. There's been some very exciting things, but also some very difficult things. Uh, transitioning your family uh, and just a new role in the church and new things for me to learn. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Your pastor's been a great friend to me, and I really appreciate you. So I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction before we turn in our Bibles. And so uh, my sermon is a sermon that I preach first really to myself. Um, Over the past several weeks, God has been working in me. And I translated that into a sermon that I preached at my church. Actually, just last Sunday, we uh, were celebrating our one year a little bit early. But um, our church is very similar to a new church. We have, uh, I call it an existing church uh, with... Uh, an established church with not much established, um, which it's an older church. It it was born about 1960s. It's a 60-year-old church, and um, a lot of things have taken place in our church. I'm excited to be a part of it. And uh, what I realized was going on in me personally was something that our church needed as a whole as well. And so I was praying, and I feel like this is the sermon God wanted me to bring to you tonight. And um, let's begin with a word of prayer. 
God, thank you so much for Faith Baptist Church and their history. God, I know that every church, as they seek you, can grow, can thrive. And that looks like different things. And God, I just thank you for Pastor Larry Hoff here. He has got a passion for doing what's right. I know uh, you've been working in him and working through this church. And I'm excited to see uh, the pavement on this parking lot and the people that are here. And I know that growth is happening. And I thank you for that. Pray that you be with this message tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Life's a cycle. That's the sermon. Life's a cycle. It begins with birth, and it changes. And through the cycles, they're different. Like my three-year-old daughter, who's very energetic and very excited. And you have lots of young ones around here. Love them and welcome them. I wish we had that many around our church. We have two. I, I let you guess which two, who, who the young ones are around our church. And, uh, but that's, that's part of the cycle. And as the kids grow up, then they become a, an older kid and they're going through school and, and they're learning things and they're bringing homework home and you're, you're going through math with them and you look at the math and you're like, no, I can't help you with that. You're going to have to ask your mom. And uh, then the cycle continues, right? And then they start thinking about college. And then they go off to college. And then they find someone. And they get married and they have kids. And the cycle keeps going and the person gets older. And then that person now is the one who their kids are growing up and they're having grandkids. They're getting older and then the aging process really starts to set in. And the end of the life cycle is something we all know is coming. We don't like to talk about it, but the end of the life cycle is death. And that's the cycle we go through as humans. But many other things go through cycles as well. So, I mean, every year we go through four cycles. We go through the four seasons. We have, we start in maybe summer. We have this nice, warm, hot weather, and then it moves on into the fall, and it's still warm, hot weather, right? In September, it's not supposed to be this warm. And then we get into the fall. The leaves start falling, and the cycle is changing. The season is changing. And then we move into winter. My wife doesn't like winter. I, I like winter. My kids love winter. And then it goes back to spring. And this new life, this new birth comes back. And it repeats the cycle. Ecclesiastes says to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Other things go through a cycle. Our clothing styles go through a cycle, right? What was once old is now popular, and they call it retro, right? Car fashion and all these things, and there's so many things that go through the cycle. Then I want you to think about your car. What would happen to your car if it didn't receive proper maintenance? Your car would die sooner than it should. Things wear out, they get thrown away if they're not taken care of. What I really want to talk about is the cycle that Christians and churches go through. I noticed when I was hearing the stories of my church, the church that I'm at, Landmark, I remember hearing stories of cycles in the church, cycles of Revival cycles of excitement, cycles of growth, lots of people coming in, cycles of spirituality, cycles of decline, cycles of people living in the flesh, cycles going up and down. The Christian life has cycles. You start with the new birth, being born again, and Jesus comes in, and it's so exciting, and it's so new, it's so fresh, and you just can't wait to tell everyone about it. And the cycle goes on to, well, do I, I mean, church is kind of the same every week, familiar, and it just becomes an obligation. 
And then it becomes, do I really have to go? And in some cases, you even see Christians who fizzle out and walk away from church. There's an example in the scripture of a church who was going through a cycle. And the cycle needed to change. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And uh, Mr. Sound Guy in the back, can you, can you go through the slides while I'm reading it? Okay, that would be great. That'll make it easier for me on the reading side. I don't know your name, but I pop. Mark. Okay, thank you, Mark. I sat back there for many years, so I give you a big hand right there. It's a great job. Revelation chapter 2, let's begin reading in verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. He's saying, I know what's going on in your church. You hold truth, and you don't like things that are wicked. You don't like things that are sinful. You don't like things that are evil. You can't bear it. And look at the rest of this verse. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. So there were people who were claiming to be Christians and apostles. And they would put them to these tests. And he says, and you have proven these false teachers to be false. And you have kind of shunned them and pushed them away. Verse 3, and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. You have done a great job. You have been in the labor. You have done the work. You have taken the burden. Sometimes you were persecuted. Sometimes you were criticized. But you kept going. Verse 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Revelation highlights for us that this church went through a cycle. Picture with me, he said, you've left the first love, your first love. And he also said, do the first works. So there's something at the beginning of the church that they had that they crossed over into a different cycle, a different season and they left that behind. And so this church is going through a cycle. And now they're focusing on something different. And these things were excluded from this phase of the church. Basically what Revelation is saying to this church is remember the stuff you used to do when you first became a Christian. You prayed and you spent time with God every day, not out of habit or obligation, but out of joy and love and passion. He says, church, remember what you did when you were first started. You loved people. You didn't have it all together. Not everything had to be in place and there were things that were messy. You were active in your community. You reached out to the poor and the needy. You had a deep abiding love for God Almighty. He says, go back to the beginning of the cycle. There you will find revitalization. But the church was facing death. Notice he says, I'm going to put you out. 
your candlestick, your influence, your ability, and your life is going to be gone unless you get back to the cycle. Unless you get back to the first love, back there. I want to highlight these. I, I mentioned them earlier, but look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2. He says, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. This is something that I think American churches have done a really good job of, and that is hating what is wrong and what is sin. And I th it's good. He commends them for it. He says it's a good thing. You hate evil. The Bible says that God hates evil evil. If you remember the story of Job, he, he prompted him with when he was talking with the devil and, and he said something really positive about Job. He said, he eschewed evil. He hates evil. That was a positive trait. And so this isn't a negative thing to be bold and to stand for truth and say what we believe and say, I, I'm against these things or I'm against those things. It's a positive thing. And then look back at verse 5. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't have this on there. Let me, let me turn there because I don't have it online here either. I think it's, uh, no, I do have it. Verse 6. Uh, we didn't read verse 6. But I want to read verse 6 now. He said, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, another church in this passage was taking the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and bringing it into the church. And he says, you need to get that out. And so here we see again that they are standing for truth. They are taking false doctrine and they are pushing it out of the church. And they're saying, we won't stand for that. And he says, it's a very good thing. But then in verse four, he says, nevertheless. I want to recall a story that happened in the New Testament with Jesus. Many times you would see the Pharisees come and they would try to tempt Jesus to get him to say something to contradict Scripture, to prove that this man's a false prophet and he doesn't know what he's talking about and we can condemn him and crucify him. They were looking and looking for ways to get rid of Jesus. And someone came and asked him, What's the greatest commandment? And probably for the Pharisees, they were hoping something like, you know, you ought to hate sinners, you ought to hate sin, and you ought to stand for what's right. Because remember, the Pharisees were people when Jesus was sitting at the table with sinners. He said, if this man was a prophet, he would know the people he's sitting with, and he wouldn't sit with them. And the woman who was caught in adultery, they dragged her in and said, Jesus, are you going to condemn her? You see how they lifted up hating sin and hating what was wrong above love. The church at Ephesus had left love. They were good haters but they weren't good at loving. They needed a change. They needed to go back to their first love. The greatest commandment was what? To love. In fact, Jesus was so smart. He's brilliant. I don't know if you've studied much about him, but he's pretty smart. And... Uh, What's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, well, I tell you what, I'm going to give you the greatest commandment, but I'm going to do more than that. I'm also going to give you the second greatest commandment. The first is to love God. But the second is to love your neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? That's the question we all like to ask. Well, I don't have to love the people who live on the other side of town because they're not my neighbor, you know. I don't have to love the people who are on the news, who disagree with my political views. I don't have to love the people who are in California and living a wicked lifestyle. 
I don't have to love the people in Canada or the people over there. I just have to love my neighbor. That's what they were looking for, a way out. But they needed to change. Change is hard. I don't want to make it sound like this is some easy thing, but change is hard. People often want a difference in their church or in their family or in their community. But sometimes they don't like to look inside and say, I need to change. You know, I'm, I'm working at, in my church and, and I have people who came in and they're, they're working a job. And sometimes I have to say, you know what, I need to change what you're doing. And they're all gung-ho about let's change our church because we know our church is declining and we want our church to go forward. But when I come to them and say, let's change your job, they're like, no. Change anything else but what I'm doing. Change anything else but my area of church. Change anything except for the music. Don't change the worship songs. Don't don't change into that kind of stuff. Or don't change um, uh, this or that because that's... Don't change where my seat is sitting. Or don't change the color of the carpet. Or don't change this or don't change that. We all struggle with change. But the right change can lead us to a healthier, longer life as a Christian and as a church. Proverbs says that you shouldn't be a friend with someone who's given to change. I don't believe at all in just changing because that's what the popular churches are doing. I don't believe in just changing because I like to change. But when we should be uh, changing is when we stop being effective and when we stop doing what matters. When my kids are disobedient, they need to change. When I am in a state of rebellion against God, I need to change. And when my church is focused on the wrong things, it needed to change. Change was the power, the agent that God used to move us from where we were to a revitalization. I just want to make it clear what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about let your pastor lead how your church changes. But this is something we all need to change of heart. Change of heart. This is what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about changing your facilities or changing your your whatever. I'm not talking about any of that. This is what I'm talking about. Changing your heart. They needed a change of heart. They needed revitalization because they left their first love. How do you leave your first love? You stop worshiping God. You stop worshiping God. I did this. Personally, we moved here a year ago. We moved into a hotel for a month with two kids, one room, all of us. It was peachy. And I had this mindset. I knew God wanted us to come. And I knew some things needed to change in the church and people's hearts needed to be revived. And I came in with this attitude like I'm going to come in and I'm going to help everyone change to be who God wants them to be. About 11 months later, God smacks us. He says, you're trying to revitalize the church, but you forgot one person. I forgot my personal worship. I left off my personal heart revitalization. That reviving of my heart. That meeting with God just to be with Him for who He is. Not because I'm trying to change His church. Not because I'm trying to build a better business within the church. A structure that's going to help us succeed in the future. Not because I'm trying to make our worship better in the church and how we sing and the music and all that, not because I'm trying to fix a better sermon, but because I'm trying 
to become who God wants me to become. I forgot to look inside. I was looking at everyone else and saying, boy, they need to change. Boy, they need to change. Boy, they need to change. Boy, they really need to change. And I didn't look at the one who needed the greatest change in their life. I want to give you two examples I want you to turn with me to 2 Chronicles. What does it look like? What does revitalization look like? 2 Chronicles chapter 34. We'll begin reading in verse 1. And if you'll follow along again for me, Mark, that'd be great. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. I probably would change countries at that time if it were me. Be like, I'm not sure about his, uh, you know, what he's doing, but I think I'm going to move out. And he reigned in Jerusalem one in 30 years. And verse 2, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Boy, I want that to be said of me. And he walked in the ways of David, his father. And listen, he declined neither to the right nor to the left. That's what I want. I want for the Bible, if it was written, a story about me, for it to say, he did that which was right and he declined not. That's what I want. That's what we're looking at. What happened? What did he do? Let's continue reading to see how he did this. Verse 3. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, so he was eight when he started, eight years later he's 16. He began to seek after the God of David, his father. It doesn't say he was asking God for wisdom to build the kingdom. Solomon, a great man, asked for a very powerful and mighty thing when God came to him and said, what should I give you? He says, I want wisdom to lead the kingdom. And as a pastor, I did the same thing. I went to God and said, God, what I really need is to be able to lead this church well. But the end of Solomon's life proves that maybe there could have been a better request for a pure heart, a heart of worship, a heart that loves the Lord, a heart that's going to obey God no matter what, because Solomon's heart was turned against the Lord. So what did this king do? Josiah, he began to seek after God. Have you sought God just for who God is? Not for what God can do for you, not for what God can do in your business or in your finances or what's broken or what needs fixing in your life. Just put all of your needs and personal problems aside. They're important. They're valuable. God cares about them. But when have you gotten on your knees and just talked and thought about God? Not about you. He began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the twelfth year, this is where it gets good. He began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. And they break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were on high above them. He cut down and the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces And made dust of them. And he strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars. And he cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. He took the false gods that the people of God had set up in their life. And he cast them down. He broke all the trees that were risen up. For people to bow down and worship. He took all the images that were made for people to bow and worship. He break them into dust. He took the bones of the priests of the false gods and he burned them. He said, I'm going to destroy and remove everything that's in the place where God should be. 
He took everything that was in the place where God should be, and he removed it. He said, I need to make room for God. That's where God should be. Get out of there. That's where God should be. Get out of there. That shouldn't be there. That's for God. Get out of there. And he had to remove those things. So I just want to ask you, what's in your life that's in a place that belongs to God? For me, I put church first. That's what I put ahead of God. I put church ahead of God. I put men of God ahead of God. I put my wife ahead of God. I put my kids ahead. I put my job, I put myself, I put several things on that top shelf. Who gets top shelf? God does. Anything that's on your top shelf besides God needs to come down, and it needs to come down right away. That's what Ephesus had a problem with. They said, we are good. And making sure people know where we stand on what's right and what's wrong. And God says, that's not church. Love him. Love God. And love your neighbor. And there's an interesting thing about those two commandments. Because Jesus said, if you say you love God and hate your brother, you're a liar. You can't obey one without obeying the other. You can't love God and hate your neighbor. That's what Jesus would say is a liar. You can't love your neighbor and hate God. Because if you don't know God, you don't know love, according to 1 John. And so those two must be obeyed together. And if our church, in our community, Landmark, doesn't love our community then it reveals that God is not up top. Something else here. Psalm chapter 150. How do you put God up top? Worship. Personal worship. Whether you get on your knees... It's not about anything else but God. And let's look at Psalm 150. We're going to walk through a psalm. One of the things I've really learned is if you want to understand prayer and worship in a deeper way, if you will get in the psalms and use them as a tool. I'm going to give you some structure from this psalm that will help you in your personal worship. This is... Your worship doesn't have to fit in this box that I give you today. But it will hopefully help you in your worship. Psalm chapter 50, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. In the Hebrew, that's one word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And what hallelujah means is exactly what they did. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Say it with me. Praise ye the Lord. I love taking praise, re praise requests instead of prayer requests. I have so much to praise the Lord for. Then it goes on. Praise God in his sanctuary. I have made it a point to have a place of worship. A quiet place. An alone place place where I don't have distractions, a place without my two children, amen, even a place away from my wife, away from, sometimes I have to leave my, my computer, I have to leave my office, I have to leave my house, I have to go somewhere where I can erase everything but be ready to worship God. It doesn't have to be one place. 
In fact, you can worship here in church with other people. And you'll see that throughout the Psalms of congregational worship together. You can worship God when you're at your job and someone asks you, how's it going? You can say, man, it's going great. Let me tell you what God has done for me. You can worship with other Christians. And when you go out to eat and wherever you go, when you rise, when you go to bed, you can worship at many different levels. But for me, to really have true worship, sometimes I need a place alone. Just me and God. Focus on him and worship. Let's continue. Praise him in the firmament of his power. It's giving us some ideas on what we could talk about when we're worshiping God. This may be referring to the, the angels, the host of heaven, those in the firmament of his power. Or maybe us looking up to the stars and saying, God, those stars are so amazing. I want to worship you. Look at your power. Look at what you can do. And what you've done. Verse 2 says, praise him for his mighty acts. Now you can look at this two ways. You can say, God, I want to praise you for the mighty acts you've done in my life. You've changed me. You saved me. You died on the cross. You've done all these things. And I just want to praise you. You can also praise him for his acts he's done for other people. God, I want to praise you for Pastor Larry and their parking lot at their new church. God, I want to praise you for the church down the street who has been growing and they're succeeding. They're reaching people. God, I want to praise you for the work you're doing in Africa with those missionaries. God, I want to praise you for your mighty works. It doesn't have to be personal. Make it global. Because he's working in other people. He's working in other ways. He's working through other churches. He's working through other things. Praise him. According to his excellent greatness. If, if you're only worshiping God for what he does, you're missing out on a deep level of worship. For who he is. His excellent greatness. His excellent greatness. I love it when you read a word that means almost the same thing as the word next to it. Excellent greatness. Greatness. It's like, I want to tell you God is great, but you think a lot of things are great. So I want to emphasize it a little bit. So I'm going to add another word in front of it. Excellent. Greatness. That's how big and how good God is. Verse 3 through 5. I won't read it all, but it talks about praising God through music, a trumpet, psaltery, a harp, a timbrel, stringed instruments and organs, not your inner organs, you know, but bum, 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 bum. And then verse six, I want everyone to breathe in. Hold your breath. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. If you just breathe, you're obligated to praise the Lord. We all ought to praise the Lord. I want to give you one more thought. This is, again, goes back to my own story. As I'm trying to revitalize my church, I feel like many people who are in a church want to see their their church revitalized. They want to see their church spiritual. They want to see their church on fire about lost souls. They want to see their church on fire for God and singing worship songs from their heart and pouring out their praise to Him. They want to see their church full. They want to see their church reaching people. They want to see their church doing great things and finding revival. But the whole church is just the sum of its parts. Church revitalization begins with the Lord. You got to look inside.
God, thank you for moving in my life. I need revitalization. I'm still growing. I need to deepen my worship with you. And I want to be better. God, I hope that you would stir in the hearts of someone here. Help us find revitalization. I love you, God. I want to keep loving you deeper and deeper. Help me to clear the top shelf and save that just for you. In Jesus' name. Amen.